for your coming today to our guest lecture on the issue of energy transition and the mining sector. So first of all, let me introduce myself. I'm Prisha Wisnium, one of lecturer on human rights and environmental law here in Law Faculty Provincial University. And for the next two and a half hours, I would like to chair this session. So hopefully you will get some knowledge and basic idea of what energy transition would be and what correlation with Indonesia's development on the energy sector. So today's guest lecture is a part of academic collaborations between research group on energy, petroleum and mining law of Ravija University and the Center of Energy Petroleum and Mineral Law and Policy, the University of Delhi. So there will be more collaborations in the future. So before I push to Rafael, uh, I would like to give time to Dr. Indah Dwi Kurbani as the director of our research group to maybe kind of give you a general overview uh, of what kind of uh, future collaborations that you will have in the future. Thank you, Priska. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, sorry, Papa. I will say in Indonesia. Uh, selamat datang. Saya ucapkan kepada Bapak dan Ibu serta rekan-rekan mahasiswa, baik S1, S2, maupun S3, di dalam guest lecture kita kali ini. Sebenarnya ini adalah rangkaian acara kami dari... Um, Beberapa, dari satu tahun yang lalu, jadi satu tahun yang lalu kami uh, riset grup ini, jadi riset grup ini launching di tahun 2002 tahun yang lalu, launching di tahun 2017, launching di tahun 2017. Pada saat itu kami berkolaborasi dengan Exxon Mobil untuk kemudian menyelenggarakan kuliah tamu pada saat itu dari uh, dari SKK Migas, kemudian berlanjut dengan Uh, International Conference yang kami selenggarakan di Jakarta bekerja sama dengan tujuh universitas di Indonesia yang salah satu pembicaranya adalah profesor yang ada di sebelah kita kali ini uh, beliau adalah uh, salah satu uh, direktur kerjasama di Center uh, Energi kemudian Petroleum and Mining Policy di dan di University di uh, di Inggris dan kebetulan Uh, Fakultas Hukum Universitas Brawijaya memiliki pusat kajian yang kami launching di tahun 2017 yaitu pusat kajian untuk energi kemudian petroleum and mining law. Pada awalnya kami hanya fokus pada pada oil and gas and mining, tapi kami kemudian memperluas pada bidang energi juga. Uh, kedepannya akan akan banyak kolaborasi yang akan kami lakukan. Uh, salah satunya pembukanya adalah guest lecture ini dengan pusat kajian yang uh, ada di Universitas Dandi dan kami juga akan melebarkan sayap terkait dengan kerjasama-kerjasama uh, ini uh, nanti uh, secara preo, uh, secara periodik kami akan melakukan kegiatan-kegiatan yang utamanya adalah untuk pengembangan keilmuan dan peningkatan sumber daya manusia di Fakultas Hukum Universitas Brawijaya terutama di dalam isu-isu energi kemudian petroleum and mining and uh, baik itu dari sisi uh, hukum lingkungannya ataupun kemudian dari sisi investasinya ataupun dari berbagai macam isu-isu uh, lainnya tergantung bagaimana kemudian kita bekerja sama dengan pihak-pihak yang memang berkepentingan di dalam hal ini uh, Mohon izin untuk memperkenalkan karena kemarin kami tidak sempat memperkenalkan beberapa anggota dari pusat kajian kami. Jadi di hadapan saudara ada eh, Pak Tunggul. Beliau adalah monggo Pak silakan berdiri. Tapi insya Allah kemudian eh, akan kami perkenalkan di di kegiatan-kegiatan kami yang lain. Kebetulan untuk eh, dari pembentukan hingga launching. 
kebetulan saya diberi amanah. Jadi uh, saya diberi amanah untuk kemudian me, apa ya, menjadi semacam seksi sibuk dalam tanda kutip uh, menjadi ketua dari pusat kajian ini. Uh, nantinya akan secara bergantian juga akan dipimpin oleh generasi-generasi lainnya atau teman-teman lainnya. Uh, baik, uh, kuliah tamu hari ini akan diberikan dalam dua sesi. Silakan uh, Bapak dan Ibu bisa mengikuti dengan uh, dan dengan baik dan juga kemudian berpartisipasi. Sesi pertama energi transition, kemudian sesi kedua tentang mining sektornya. Bagi tiga peserta yang memberikan tanggapan ataupun pertanyaan dalam bahasa Inggris karena untuk mempermudah Rafael e, memahami apa yang akan Anda berikan tanggapan e, kami akan memberikan merchandise berupa buku dan souvenir dari SKK Migas tapi kami batasi hanya tiga jadi silakan untuk tiga penanya baik, itu mungkin yang bisa saya sampaikan enjoy the show karena sebenarnya Uh, kami juga akan mempublish guest lecture ini uh, di uh, di website online kita. Jadi silahkan menyimak dengan baik dan mudah-mudahan berguna untuk pengembangan keilmuan kita. Terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Oke, okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Indah Dwi Kumbali. Then we will have kind of a mini break for 15 minutes. Then we will uh, going back to this room to continue the second sessions about current challenge for the mining law. Uh, before that, I would like to uh, introduce uh, Rafael. So his name is Professor Rafael Hefron from the Center of Energy, Petroleum and Mineral Law and Policy, the University of Delhi, the UK. He is a professor for Global Energy Law and Sustainability and also John Monet professor in the Just Transition to a Low Carbon Economy. And currently, he is the most cited professor on energy law according to Google Scholar. So there are 1,286 articles that cited all of his publications. So he is someone that really expert on the issue. So without more introduction, I will let Rafael to give the session. Okay, so thank you very much for that uh, welcome. And thank you very much for the invitation to speak here today. And I think it's great to uh, continue the collaboration that we started last year. I don't know how many of you were here last year when I gave a talk. But the great thing about today's talk is that if you, if you miss a few minutes, if you get distracted by your mobile phones, it is being recorded on video so you can watch it later um, instead of watching something on YouTube or Netflix or online, you can uh, watch this uh, beautiful video again and again. So, um, as Prisha said, I'm going to speak uh, firstly on the energy transition and then talk uh, more specifically about mining law. So the idea is to give you a flavor or a viewpoint on what's happening in the energy transition internationally nationally and locally across the world and then in the second session looking at those issues and how they affect uh, the mining sector. And we will have some time for questions after this session and also at the end of the session. Um, so do think about that. So um, there's been a small um, introduction to who um, I am. So I'm uh, a qualified lawyer, and you can see that in the corner there. Uh, in the UK, we have a distinction of lawyers. Some of you may know uh, the barrister and the solicitor. So generally, the barrister is the person who does the work in court, and the solicitor is the, per is the lawyer who does a lot of the work outside the courtroom. And I should make a distinction 
uh, between a barrister and solicitor. Sometimes uh, people get confused about the word uh, barrister. And I remember the first day when I went to study for my PhD at the University of Cambridge and another student said to me, what did you do before you came back to study for your doctorate? And I said, I was a barrister. And they said, why does someone who makes coffee need to come and do a, do a PhD for three years? So just, uh, you know, don't get confused between, you know, the words, you know, a barrister is someone who makes coffee, not a barrister who is representing uh, clients in court. So I, I thought to myself, they're letting everyone into Cambridge these days, but I, I, I didn't say that to the other, to the other student. But uh, one of the things I do want to highlight is, as well as being an academic and a barrister, I, you know, I keep in touch with the uh, practitioner community and I am the consulting editor for the Hallsbury's Laws of England series and when we think about international energy transactions around the world a lot of them are based on England and Wales common law so the sort of common law uh, legal system and we think about practitioners working across the world but you know, everyone needs to know something about the common law legal system. So, for those of you who don't know um, where I'm from, you know, it's been introduced, the Centre for Energy Petroleum and Mineral Law and Policy. And we are all the way up there, you can see the red dot in uh, Scotland, in the United Kingdom. And just off the coast of the red dot, the reason the Centre for Energy Law, uh, or the Centre for Energy Petroleum and Mineral Law and Policy, the reason it is up there is because that's where the majority of the oil and gas of the UK is located. So the government and the legal practitioner community wanted a group of legal researchers and policy researchers to work on these issues and that's where we're uh, based. And you can see uh, these recent uh, news reports and, and they keep flocking in about Dundee being a very good place to visit. So I always say, you know, the next time you're thinking of a romantic holiday or some of you who are thinking of that romantic holiday in a few years, you know, you're saving up for that at the moment as a student all that money, you're not, you're not going out to meet friends, you're saving your money for a nice holiday. When you look at these news reports about beautiful Dundee, so Lonely Planet, which is one of the biggest guidebooks in the world, saying that uh, Dundee is a top 10 place to visit. Bloomberg, a major news agency, the Wall Street Journal, something all fine year law students should be reading in your spare time. And then, since we're in Indonesia, I put this last one in the corner. Dundee ranked ahead of tropical islands as a must-see place to visit. So, you know, I, I say it to a lot of, uh, let's, let's say, foreigners, uh, Australians or English people, that you should no longer go to Bali. You just have to come to Dundee. And I send them that, uh, that report. So, you know, the next time you're thinking of that holiday, you're thinking of that romantic trip, come along to Dundee, one of the best places to visit in the world. And also, you can top up your knowledge on energy law. So that's our, our building in the background. And we are the world's oldest university affiliated energy law and policy centres, so the oldest in the world at 42 years old. And we like to see ourselves as a global or the global voice of energy law. We have over 5,000 alumni across 
around 140 different countries in the world. So students, I think from over 140 countries have attended our centre in Dundee. And I think currently we have three to four, three to five, I think, energy ministers in different countries in the world. And if you're looking for something to read, you know, after you get tired of watching this video five or six times, and you want something to read instead, we do have this journal, Global Energy Law and Sustainability, uh, coming out next year, uh, and that would be something you can uh, you can put on your bookshelf in your room and make sure um, you read through. So, when we think of the energy transition, we think, you know, the world we live in today is changing and changing, you know, at a very fast uh, pace. And, you know, one of the things when we think about the energy sector is the huge amount of money that is going to be spent in the energy sector. So, a very conservative estimate there, you can see, is 44 trillion would be spent by 2040. So, if you ever thought, you know, you are, you are in the wrong room as, you know, a law student or a practitioner, you're, you know, you should look at that figure and think you're in the right room. If over your career you even get this very small 0.0001 percentage of that 44 trillion, you are going to be a very rich lawyer. So you have made the right choice in thinking about studying energy law. You know, not only can you make a lot of money, but hopefully after today's talk, you can also think about making uh, the world a better place as well. So you can see the last figure there. Energy is around 10% of global GDP. So that, in a simplistic terms, what that equates to is energy-related expenditure equates to around one out of every ten dollars spent in the world. So it really is a significant part of the global economy. And one of the other few sectors that is as big as energy is health, which is around you know ten or eleven percent as well. So they are the two big sectors and we should remember that when we think about the importance of the energy sector. And I just put up this cartoon because always when we talk about energy and we think about the impact of the energy sector in our societies, you will hear people talk about the impact of energy in terms of the effect on the environment, and I'm sure you can see that here in Indonesia itself. And you also think about the issues of climate change. Again, you can see that here in Indonesia. All of you, I'm sure, are following the news that the capital city is going to sink by 2050. Estimated to have disappeared by 2050, according to some scientists. So, you think even if you are someone who's feeling a bit like Donald Trump in the US and you're thinking you're denying that climate change exists and for those again who are watching the, the news yesterday or today you will have seen that the G7 talks are going on in Paris or have, I think maybe have just come to a conclusion Donald Trump did not attend the session on climate change. But if you think about this cartoon, even if you are a climate change denier, a lot of what we're talking about when we talk about energy law, climate change law, environmental law, yet when we're talking about the energy transition, we are in essence talking about making the world a better place. And you think that list on the right, that's what we're talking about when we talk about the energy transition, the influence we're trying to have. So, sustainability, more jobs, health, livable cities, 
you know, not sinking cities. And, you know, healthy children, clean water, clean air, access to energy, etc., etc. So, you know, what we are talking about is making the world a better place. And even if you don't think, as the person says, you know, what if it's a big, big hoax and we create a better world? So, I mean, it's a win win if you think, if you uh, think about the situation. So, when we think broader about the situation and uh, we think about energy and its effect on the wider economy, the figures go even higher. We think about you know, that figure of 44 trillion going up to 75 trillion. And we can think, you know, something relevant here in Indonesia, we think about access to energy and reliable access to energy all across the nation, all across the different islands. And we think of the sustainable development goals and in particular sustainable develop development goal number seven, which is about energy. And there has been research done on this uh, the author's names are mentioned there, and that research shows that the energy sustainable development goal is the most important or influential. If you get the energy sustainable development goal correct, that will influence you achieving all the other sustainable development goals. And, you know, another thing is when we think about you know, how fast the world is changing. We can think about, you know, people using the mobile phone. And I can look down at the audience now, and I see, you know, probably 10 or 15 people on their mobile phones instead of listening to me. But, you know, if I was in a lecture theater 15 years ago, barely, you know, maybe only 10 or 20% of the class would have a mobile phone. I was chatting to a colleague last week and you know one of their parents who's very elderly 70 plus had sent them a very long text message and I said I said jokingly it must have taken them you know maybe five hours to write that 10 line text message and you think of all the things we can do on a mobile phone that maybe our grandparents, you know, think they would have thought never in their lifetime would you have had that piece of technology. And it's something they still, you know, can't, let's say, uh, handle and, you know, they spend five hours sending a text of ten lines. But, you know, the impact of a mobile phone, and we think, you know, there is a global supply chain for the mobile phone industry. There are rare metals used in mobile phones. And this, you know, a problem when we think about something like the mining sector. It's a problem when we think about distributive justice, when we're thinking, where does that money go? Where does the money go from the energy and natural resources sector? And you can see from this example, so you see here, Democratic Republic of Congo, where a lot of the cobalt that's used in all your smartphones is sourced from. I think it has 50 to 60 percent of the world's uh, supply of cobalt at the moment. The people who are mining that cobalt, there is a lot of children working down the mines mining that cobalt. Estimates that around 50 to 60 thousand children essentially engaged in child labor or some type of, you know, you could argue a form of slavery to get that cobalt out of the ground. The estimated tax rate for that cobalt that the Democratic Republic of Congo receives is 4.5%. And if you think, where does all the money from the mobile phone industry end up? Anyone want to guess? So Switzerland, quite, maybe quite close. 
I won't say hi close because I'm, I'm being reported. The Caribbean. So some some maybe tax savings in the in the Caribbean. So I'm I'm glad it wasn't me who suggested uh, that answer. Um, since since again we're being recorded. But we think we think about you know the cobalt comes here, the foam is made in Asia, and then you think about the Western consumers in Europe, and you think who's producing your foam? Apple. Let's say let's take for example Apple. And the money gets sent over to Apple headquarters, um, and that's where the money is located. What do you think the profit rate for Apple on a mobile phone is? Do you think it's higher than that 4.5 percent that the, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo received? Yes. So you could look at the figures, and maybe from. Uh, the figures would show you that Apple is making 12 to 15 percent from its mobile phones. It's one of its highest, if not the highest selling products, most profitable products. And you think, why is there not a more fair share or a better distribution of the revenue from you know this supply chain? Why is it that the Democratic Republic of Congo receives such um, a small amount. And we can take in a similar way about the effect or the distribution of CO2 around the world. So I'm not expecting you to fully understand uh, this map in a, in a very fast fashion, but the idea here is just to show that the distribution of CO2 is uneven and generally it ends up in an unfair way, being more distributed towards um, poor communities than, let's say, the richer communities. But when we think about these issues, so such as the distribution of CO2 around the world, we think about the global supply chain of the different products we use that require different energy or natural resources. And we can think about, there is a realization across the world about the impact of what we do in one country has an impact in another country. And this is shown in a recent case in Australia. So relatively close by, a recent case in March earlier this year. And one of the things the judge noted in this case in a case around the coal mining sector. One of the things he noted was, if he gave permission for the coal mine to go ahead, there would be consequences. There would be additional CO2 produced off that coal, and that, that CO2 would affect, would have an impact on other countries. And that was one of the reasons that he rejected and did not give permission for the coal plant to go ahead. So we can think that that is a major uh, judgment to say people are finally thinking of what is the impact of their activity beyond their own country. So in many ways, people are, their perspective on the energy sector is broadening. It's not just about what happens in your own country, it's about the effect on other countries as well. And we can see that in terms of an agreement that was signed four years ago, the Paris COP21 agreement. And for some of the lawyers in the room, they may class this as a piece of what is called international soft law. And the idea behind that being this is a non-binding piece of legislation. But I, I would argue differently and argue this Paris Agreement in 2015. Does anyone know how many countries have already signed, signed and ratified this agreement? 
maybe some of your lecturers will, will remember. Or, or maybe I shouldn't uh, ask them just yet. So I will avoid them answering the question, but it is 188 countries at least have already signed and ratified this agreement. And you think that's in the space of less than three and a half years. Never before has there been such cooperation. And you think even if the US has sort of decided to withdraw from uh, cooperating with the agreement, they haven't yet withdrawn uh, their signature from the agreement, they've, but they've withdrawn their cooperation or participation. They're joining other countries such as Syria, who has lacked a government over the last four years, and North Korea. So it's not a great position for the US, the so-called leader of the free world, to be in a group of countries that they used to class before as uh, the axis of evil, you know, Syria and North Korea, and now suddenly they have joined with them on the issue of climate change. So we can think, you know, one of the things um, that Fritja highlighted that I'm working on um, and that I've received uh, a recent award, the General A Professorship on the Just Transition, is related to something that was in, written into the Paris Agreement on the Just Transition. And this issue of the just transition, because what we're essentially talking about here is that the energy sector we currently have is an unfair energy sector. It is an energy sector that contributes in a major way to inequality in society. And CO2 production has been shown to increase societal inequality uh, to a greater extent. And we think in the Paris Agreement, they, de they mentioned specifically the just transition. But it received little attention initially, but then uh, began slowly to receive greater attention since 2017. So what we're referring to in terms of the just transition is a total societal shift in terms of how we see the energy sector. And we're thinking, what is the effect of the energy sector across the whole of society, and not just thinking about you know, the energy sector itself. And by energy, I include mining, I include oil and gas extraction, renewables, etc., etc. And what we need to see is more inclusive decision-making. So when we think about energy, we are thinking what are people in the health or sector thinking, about the labour sector thinking? All those people who work in the energy sector, they would have, some of them would have to be retrained into other jobs because those jobs would not exist uh, slowly in some of the areas of the energy sector. And then how does the energy sector relate to industrial policy? A lot of industry here in Indonesia relies heavily on you know, cheap energy. Some of that may have to change or alternative energy sources may have to be introduced in order to ensure that this energy transition happens. And we can see last year there may not be too many announcements from the G7 talks that have just happened. But we can see last year the G7 talks, they even highlighted this issue of the just transition in the communique that was produced after the G7 last year. So already our political leaders globally are thinking about this just transition and how it's going to impact on society and what is the law, what is the policy that needs to be introduced in order to achieve this just transition to a low carbon economy. Some countries are taking it a step further and they are already ahead of the actions of many other countries. They are already instigating or establishing new government units 
and I put the word here, like a just transition commission. So they're setting up a type of uh, regulatory or expert body that is aiming at delivering this energy transition. And you can see this in, I've highlighted several countries, maybe which are more advanced, but in particular, Scotland, Germany, and also New Zealand, which is not too far away. They started theirs uh, earlier in February this year, I think, and they had a major event in May to launch that Just Transition unit there. And essentially for lawyers, what this is, is a growth in terms of public administrative law. So it's about setting up a new unit of government that has these new powers or some type of powers in order to be able to deliver the energy transition. And just to highlight some of our own work on this just transition and who else is thinking about this just transition. Um, a group of universities, some companies, some different institutions. We held a conference in March this year in Trinidad, in uh, the Caribbean. And we had Shell and BP and several other energy companies who were behind that. So already some of these big energy companies are thinking about the transition and thinking about how it affects their business into the future. And some of these companies are already thinking about how will their company look by 2030? And they're thinking about how will investment in oil and gas look in 2030? Additionally, Harvard University in the US, they have their own Just Transition initiative. And they have looked at uh, the issue with investors, which is around $4 trillion, um, dollars, or they manage $4 trillion. Dollars and they are looking at moving that four trillion, investing that in companies and businesses that support or are engaged in the energy transition. So already you can see the effect that people are, there's a growing interest in adapting your company or your government or different policies towards this um, energy transition. And we think you know, in terms of society changing or adapting to this energy transition is one of the biggest challenges of our time. So we think, you know, what is the major challenge for your generation and, you know, our generation? It is around this transition to a low carbon economy. And we can see the effect of the energy sector, you know, need look no further than, you know, the rising sea levels and what is predicted to happen to Jakarta by 2050. And, you know, to highlight, we can think as lawyers, what types of justice are we concerned about when we think about this transition? And we think about distributive justice. So like I mentioned earlier, about the, the revenue from energy resources. And you can even see it here that it is a concern in Indonesia about how much money has left Indonesia from its own energy resources. How much is left because it has gone out in the hands of foreign companies. Yes, companies are entitled to make a profit, but should they be allowed to make what our economists refer to as super normal profits? And should more money have stayed in Indonesia instead of, you know, uh, a significant portion leaving? But that's what we refer to when we talk about distributive justice. We also think about procedural justice. You know, is the procedure correct? And there are, there are the plans that have been introduced for, or the, the sort of outline plans for the new capital. You know, will the impact on the environment and society be properly studied? And that's, you know, that type of uh, environmental impact assessment is something we would be talking about when we refer to procedural justice. Recognition justice, 
is around recognizing the rights of individuals, in particular recognizing those of indigenous communities, their right to a way of land in terms of how they use uh, land and nature. Then we think of restorative justice. That's in talking about the damage done or the impact on the environment by energy companies. What is the duty to restore the environment to the way they found it when they started out with the energy uh, extraction? And then, finally, there is one issue that is connected with uh, the magazine and also, does anyone know what, that, what the uh, drink is called? No, no one willing to, to guess, but it's, it's uh, the Cosmopolitan, but the same, the same as the magazine. But that is not to be confused with the other type of justice that we're referring to here, and one that is becoming increasingly significant, and that is cosmopolitan justice. It's a great shame that uh, a magazine and a cocktail decided to take the same name as this, as this form of uh, justice. But we think cosmopolitan justice has been around for, um, you know, over 2,000 years, but we think the idea, the central idea behind cosmopolitan justice is that you believe that you're a citizen of the world. You aren't thinking that you're a citizen of Indonesia or Australia or the UK or beautiful Ireland where I'm from. You're thinking instead you're a citizen of the world. And that's when we think of the energy sector we think back to that Australian judgment that I mentioned before. We're thinking about the impact of what we do in the energy sector across borders. And more and more we're thinking about the global supply chains for the products we use, like the mobile phone, like the computer. What is our global impact? Not just what is our impact locally where we live or where the nation where we live but our global impact. And that is when, what we think about in terms of cosmopolitan justice, which is on the rise, and we can see that in different countries across the world. So, as lawyers, when we think about this just transition to a low-carbon economy, what we are thinking about using in our arguments are these forms of justice. Distributive, procedural, recognition, restorative, and cosmopolitan. And, you know, something that we hope that the research group here on energy will join as well is the Just Transition Initiative that has, you know, been started with universities. And you can see here a selection of universities from around the world, US, Australia, UK, European, plus the European Commission, the UK uh, Energy Research Centre, University of the West Indies, and there are several other partners or members as well. Um, and the idea here is to think about how can we accelerate that uh, just transition. And you can already see, you know, something that um, we can already see the effects as a result of that Australian decision earlier this year. We are seeing an acceleration in decision making around this just transition. I just wanted to highlight something that I know coal is very important here in Indonesia. And you can also see um, this coal project in Kenya, in Africa. And just very recently, permission was rejected. A $2 billion project. So despite all the jobs, all the sort of community projects that the company was going to do, it was rejected because of the potential damage that this coal project would do. There is a realization now that the, there is data to show, despite the benefits of a coal power, power plant, actually there's a lot of negatives. 
and increasingly we have the data to show there are more negatives than positives. So some are telling you that code is still an option, even in a developing country, there are better alternatives and increasingly we are able to see that. And this is just one example and one of the reasons it failed was over the environmental impact assessment process. It didn't follow essentially procedural law, so that procedural justice point was the key, one of the key arguments argued um, in that case. So, one of the ideas we as, we as lawyers you know, have to connect with is we have to connect to policymakers and we have to connect to those people who talk about money. So these are three quotes from a famous Hollywood movie that in many ways, for many people, it tells you a lot about America. Does anyone know what these uh, quotes are from? Does any, anyone ever want to be a, a stockbroker or someone who was working in the, uh, you know, trading on, on uh, the stock exchange? Any, anyone know what the, the greedy American movie was? So Wall Street. And there has been an update uh, to that movie as well. But these are the three, three quotes from that. But you think, as lawyers, we can have our arguments around procedural justice, distributive justice, cosmopolitan justice, but we do need to be able to make that link about how much are things going to cost. Generally, and I say generally, policymakers are all focused on cost. They want to do things at, uh, let's say, a lower cost. But sometimes doing things at a, a more reasonable cost has a better outcome for uh, society. So, in terms of thinking about the energy transition, I just want to give you one example about how technology is lowering the cost significantly. And this is something that when we consider Indonesia, we consider the potential for battery technology that is linked to uh, renewable energy technology, we can think of, you know, there could be a huge impact in the way the electricity system operates. So, um, several months ago, I was invited over by a Spanish uh, energy technology company that produced batteries. And it's, it's a rare, usually a rare occurrence when energy companies invite lawyers to you know, for, for a, a day in their company. Usually they invite engineers or economists, but they rarely invite lawyers along. But the idea is that a lot of the legislation is not in these, it's not in these, com their, these companies' favor. So the current legislation does not favor new technology. And that is maybe something that is, one could question in Indonesia, does the current legislation is it favourable towards new energy technologies? And we see here on um, the use of energy batteries in, for the electricity system. And at the moment, if you bought a battery for your home to use, you would have an eight to 10 year payback. So if you bought it, the price it would cost you, it would take you eight to 10 years to pay back that cost. And very, you know, the company only gives you a 10 year guarantee. So conceivably, you could spend 10,000, um, let's say, dollars on the battery. The savings you would make would be 10,000, so you've made no money after 10 years, and then conceivably, your guarantee is gone, so it breaks the next year, you know, you have made no money. But if it lasts for five extra years, the lifetime it's expected, then from year 10 to year 15, you are going to make some savings. But for many of us, 
That's a long time to wait to start making money, 10 years. Many of us value money more immediately than in a 10 year time frame. Many of you would far prefer to spend your money going on a holiday to Dundee in the UK than waiting 10 years to, you know, and spending it on a battery uh, in your house. But to show you the batteries, there are three pictures depending on the size of battery you can get. But you can see these batteries here, you can see, you know, it's just hanging up. It's not that going to impact on your, your uh, room that much. Or if you like design, you can have a, a glow. And if you're very, if you're feeling very fancy, you can even get some painted ones. And these are painted by different artists. So that it looks, it combines a piece of art and a piece of energy technology um, into your home. But the idea with these batteries is the more of them you have in a region, if you connect them together, then you can start making major savings. So let's say a city like Milan, in a, in a certain area, if you had 300 people who had batteries, you could reduce your cost by 60%. So you would save in your energy bill, your electricity bill, 60%. And you would be able to pay back your battery in two to three years. So after two years, you would start, make, you, you would start saving money. And potentially, if you had up as high as 300 units, you could create what is written up there, a virtual power plant. And that virtual power plant, in days where the sun was shining a lot, you could even potentially make money by selling the electricity back to the market. So already you can see the effect for ourselves in terms of we would have more money, we would save more money, but you can already see the effects. You don't actually therefore need to buy any more electricity from the same energy providers that there are currently. And in many countries, technology like this could be transformative. But the problem is, in many countries, legislation does not support the entry of something like this virtual power plant into the electricity market. And what we need to see is more support given to this type of technology, these type of companies that could form out of this technology and so that they could enter um, the electricity market. So <clears throat> one of the big problems for, for these is around access to the electricity grid. So that's the type of legislation that we need changed and also subsidies. When you consider the subsidies may be given to current electricity providers, current, current energy providers. These type of companies, these new companies that would make a huge difference do not receive, in many cases, any subsidy at all. But what if we gave them an equal subsidy as we give other energy providers so that essentially you gave someone a subsidy that would support their payment of at least 50% of the cost of a battery. And that would mean after a year and a half you would start saving you know, at least 60% on your energy bills. So in that context, when we think of investment in the energy sector, we can see investment across the world in 2040. A lot, one third of that investment will be in electricity. Electricity demand is going up and we think of the potential population growth going to go up here in Indonesia by 2030. I think some projections say 15 to 20 million there is going to be significant demand 
increase in demand for electricity. And another area is grid development. Again, that's a problem here in Indonesia. We think more and more people need energy access. There needs to be an improvement in the electricity grids to ensure that that energy access can happen and reliability can be introduced into the electricity system. So one of the reasons policymakers are getting more interested in the energy sector is they are seeing what the, the cost of not doing anything is. And one of the costs you can see here is the welfare costs of pollution globally are equated at 4.6 trillion per year. So you can you can see that there is this you know equated to around 6.2 percent of global economic output. So if you think if global economic growth is running at, let's say, 2 or 3 percent. If pollution is costing you around 6 percent, there is another way of tackling or ensuring that you have economic growth, and that is by trying to reduce the effect of pollution. So if you reduce that loss of 6, 6 percent, um, you could also have an impact on global growth. So this is why um, policymakers are looking or are looking at that figure of 4.6 and saying, well, if you reduce pollution, some of that can come into our economies. Another reason is we are seeing a lot of premature deaths across the world. So 16% of all global deaths um, are um, pollution related. So if you were to equate that, again, maybe in a simplistic term, one out of every five of us in this room, so 20% of us in this room, are going to die due to uh, you know, a pollution-related, pollution uh, for a pollution-related reason. But if you're an economist, one of the things you're thinking about is if people die from a premature death, that is a loss of economic input to our economy. So if you die before you reach retirement age, you are not going to contribute to the economy. We lose your ability to contribute to the workforce. Therefore, that is a loss to the economy for an economist. So that's what they are thinking. The more premature deaths we have, the lower uh, possibility of more people contributing to the economy the more people that contribute to the economy, the greater economic growth you will have. And that's something uh, you want to reduce. Another reason is we can see more visibly the impact of pollution. We can see the impact already of climate change. This is costing economies huge money and very big money in terms of insurance for businesses. Does anyone know uh, where this picture is from? Yeah, so Venice. Another romantic city like Dundee. <laughs> and another place where many people spend their, you know, they go on romantic trips with their partners. But here were two, two friends of mine on their, they were on their honeymoon after they got married. And what happened? He was in Italy. What most uh, people in Italy do is they like to buy a nice pair of Italian shoes. What happened is Italian shoes that he bought for three or four hundred euros, they got ruined when he walked through the floods because of climate change in central Venice. Um, so, but the bigger issue here is, what about all the businesses in that area? They all need insurance. Slowly after repeated floods, it becomes harder, more costly to get insurance. You know, it also affects tourism. 
You think about it here in Indonesia, I think tourism accounts for 15% of GDP. You know, the less people that are able to come to Jakarta because it's sinking, the less tourism income you're going to get. You, you'll have to send everyone to Bali, even, even uh, you know, more tourists or more Australians and English going to Bali. But we think, you know, of these effects, and you can obviously see that right here, not just thinking about Jakarta, but also thinking about different other different islands uh, around Indonesia. And this is an impact on tourism. It's also an impact on doing business. The cost of business is going up because of pollution and because of the effects on the environment and because of uh, the, con the results uh, into climate change. So already we can see early indicators of where money is going and again this is why policy makers are thinking even more about this issue because they are seeing investment funds are slowly switching away from what they see as higher risk business activity the ff there stands for um, fossil fuel oil gas coal slowly investment funds are switching to non fossil fuel investments. And we can see that with the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, one of the biggest investment funds in the world, divesting significantly, I believe, in oil and gas and coal assets. And we can think um, also about the effect of the global economic crisis of 2007 to 2009 and there are still effects of this economic crisis. One of them is people have become more conservative in how they invest. So when you add in that conserv conservatism, conservatism and you add in all these other issues in terms of the, you know, the energy sector that I've mentioned it's becoming harder and harder to get the money to do certain activities in the energy sector. And we can see this in terms of when you want to raise finances for energy projects. One of the things you have to adhere to in raising finance for your project are the equator principles. And the equator principles are generally for medium to large size uh, international banks who provide you with project finance for your project. And they require you to do an environmental impact assessment before you even get permission to do the project. And that amount in terms of environmental impact, to do that assessment will cost 10 or 15% of the overall project cost. So if your project costs one, two billion, imagine the example I gave from Kenya, two billion, 15%. You have to spend 300 million before you even know if you're going to get permission for the project. That is a huge risk to take for any company, to spend 300 million not knowing if you will actually get the permission to go ahead. And in the case of Kenya, they did not get the permission. So who pays that money? Will a company take the risk of trying to build a coal plant in Kenya again? Arguably, uh, they will not. And we can think of some of the other effects of the financial crisis. Because one of the things we thought, we have, you know, have thought about is we wanted a bit more disclosure after the financial crisis. What was actually really happening, why did the financial crisis occur? And one of the things that has happened are leaks in terms of financial data and significant one in terms of uh, tax and taxation. How much companies have been taxed, how much tax avoidance is going on and you can probably see that in some of the companies operation, foreign companies operations here in Indonesia and you can see this produced in two books, 
uh, one called the Pen of the Papers and the other Paradise Papers. You can download, or they were leaked on the internet, you can probably get, get access to some of those reports online. But that has prompted global reform um, around taxation, and in particular that affects, uh, in some cases, the way of doing business for energy companies. And when we think of global, we think of energy reform, you can see this list of different countries in the world, in different regions, who are all thinking about how can we reform our energy law to take account of the energy transition and the effects of this energy transition. How can we ensure that despite everything that is going on in the energy sector, how can we ensure that there is a continued or higher investment in the energy sector? And that, that is a problem here in Indonesia in terms of increasing external investment in the energy sector. So we can see in those countries, uh, China, Southeast Asia, Australia, New Zealand, in Caribbean, Central America, US, South America, Middle East, and Europe. So all across the world there is um, countries and governments looking at energy law reform. So it's a major uh, growth area. And when we talk about the transition, one of the things we want countries to think about is how are they going to achieve that in a fair way? And one of the things when they're drafting this legislation, we are thinking about you know, principles, what are guiding principles that should be applied, let's say in Indonesia, to the UK, to Brazil, to Nigeria, to China, etc., etc. And we can think there is, you know, when we talk about energy, there is no difference in what, what countries are doing. The reason there is no difference is energy technology works the same way. The technology for solar or wind works the same way it does here as it does in other countries. So we, we can think about there being a common set of principles that we can apply when we draft this new energy law across the world. And they, there's a list there, the, the paper there can be downloaded uh, for free um, online. And this is something also that we need to ensure that those who make judgments on disputes in the energy sector can adhere to. So what we don't want to see are judgments in the past that may have used, let's say, economic or investment law principles. What we want to see are ones that use energy, thinking about the energy sector itself, and thinking about those different types of justice I mentioned earlier, procedural, distributive, recognition, uh, restorative, and cosmopolitan justice. We want to see them to the fore in judgments by judges. So one of the things we have done in Europe is speak to the judges in the European Courts of Justice to open uh, sort of conversation with them and here there is a group from the European Federation of Energy Law Associations meeting with judges to talk about some of you know, this issue along with others uh, with the leading judges who do make judgments on the energy disputes uh, with the big energy companies in Europe. So, when we can conclude from this uh, session, you know, we can see a sort of a recap. We think of that big investment in energy. Those big sums that I talked about at the start, 44 trillion up to 75 trillion. And the big thing is, when we think about all that money that's going to be spent in the energy sector, we want to make sure it's spent in a just way. We want to make sure the benefits are there for all of society, unlike what has happened before 
and you think, unlike what has happened maybe here in Indonesia, where perhaps too great a percentage left Indonesia and went to, uh, let's say, foreign countries or foreign companies or even foreign individuals' bank accounts. We can also think about, you know, the world is changing faster than ever before. Thinking about the different resources being dug out of the ground from our, the use of our mobile phone to thinking about that battery technology that maybe in five years could be affordable that we could all buy and put in our own homes. And then to that broad understanding of globally we're thinking, how do we achieve this low carbon economy? How do we achieve this just transition to a low carbon economy? We think about those different types of justice, the five different types of justice. How do we make sure that they influence policy making over the next five, 10 to 15 years? And then we can also think about the early indicators of the effect when we follow where the money is going around the world. And already we can see some early changes in where investment is being made and also some recent legal change over the last 10 years since the financial crisis and already there is significant, you know, a significant amount of momentum for this just transition to a low carbon economy that is increasingly making it harder to make investments in oil, gas and coal because we do want to see a just transition to a low carbon economy and we do already see some of the low carbon technologies are coming rapidly down in cost and if the law is changed you know they could even have um, this, their use could be accelerated across um, our economy so for any of you who uh, want a selection of papers that this first hour is based on, uh, feel free uh, to get in touch. So I'll finish the first session uh, on that note. So if you have any questions, I think we have uh, 10 or 15 minutes for questions now. So thank you. Any problems such as inequality, spreading of the quality of resources and over overspending of it. Uh, as a environment, as an expert in your field, so I would also like to ask: What are the foreseeable, uh, uh, foreseeable uh, challenges that our country will face, and what are some of your uh, recommendations and solutions in facing this problem? And uh, another question is: we, You talked about virtual power plant and how it is very profitable in the near future, and how that legislative, uh, legislative councils. Uh, reject this in our country especially. Are there any way to incentivize both the company and the government to, to take on this uh, this new bill and reform to make sure that our country is not only sustainable, but it can also create a greater quality of living, I think. Uh, my question is uh, related with the sustainable energy or sustainable uh, power plant. It, for me, basically, it's, uh, for development country like Indonesia, is quite not fair. Basically, because uh, especially for the ratification of the uh, ratification about energy and uh, global warming itself, because uh, all of the country, especially development country, is supposed to be green. As, as they have to change their power plant and also also uh, their use, uh, consumption of uh, electricity, at, at which Indonesia at the moment is most most of it is uh, supplied by coal coal power plant. That one is uh, is more more cheaper and affordable for our country. And second, we do have a lot of coal in Indonesia, and and also that is you it easy and it basically is most it quite uh, more more fast for 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 
for structuring and uh, make a new plan, new new plan for both. Indonesia also have a lot of uh, sustainable energy, like uh, because we rely on the risk of fire, so there is there's a lot of uh, what we call it uh, thermal energy that we can we can utilize. But however, as mostly that uh, because I do I do work, work working previously in the energy sector also. Most 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 of most of the area that we can for for the for the thermal thermal power plant, one is remote area. So it's very 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 expensive investment, and pre uh, before that it need to be exploration that it takes five years and more, and that costs a lot of because one drill it will be cost around five hundred million for one hole. Around that, so and it, it need uh, 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 at least a thousand hole for ensuring that it it have uh, what you call it uh, have capacity to produce a good electricity. And secondly, the uh, uh, what you call it the transmission from the green area to the city will cost a lot of. So that all of the renewable energy that that the world expect Indonesia uh, to create or to change, it will cost our country a lot of money. So basically, it needs to be balanced from the from the big countries as US, Europe, and so on that already have uh, positioning. What do you call it? They have already have us. A lot of money that can can give support to another country like Indonesia that still uh, still in the development stage, and also that if we, for example, that if if the the government is uh, what you call it, is other country is not supported Indonesia, Indonesia is also the second uh, rainforest, the biggest rainforest after Brazil that now is in the in the crisis for the what we put push fire and the. Uh, fire in the this big fire in the forest. So Indonesia have in the in the near future have, have the same what you call it risk also for that. Especially now now uh, at the moment we, we still have are doing for relocation of the our of what you call it capital city in which in Kal is Kalimantan that's is in my colleague is debating is called that's near with the protected forest, Bukit Sukan, uh, Bukit Suharto, that's will be create a lot of challenge. So, uh, in, in terms of that, my question is how the what you call other others uh, country can support development country so they can uh, what you call it uh, can creating the more sustainable energy in 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 with, with their limitation okay thank you so you know when we're thinking about the energy sector and you're thinking specifically about the energy sector here in indonesia you're thinking there are obviously a lot of uh, fossil fuels oil gas and coal are, are used but when we're thinking about a new policy direction you know, the reality is you can't keep going and maybe, uh, you know, when it comes to 2050, you say, oh, we have to move the capital city again because uh, the new capital city is sinking. So, you know, when are we going to make a radical policy change? How many people live in Jakarta at the moment? I think it's some estimates are between 18 to 20 million people. If you believe what the scientists, some of the scientific reports are saying is that the whole of Jakarta will be underwater by 2050. That is about relocating 18 to 20 million people. For me, that is a huge issue. I come from a very small country, Ireland, which has only 3.75 million people you know, less than a quarter of Jakarta's population. But, 
you know, you at some point are going to need radical policy and legislation considering the challenges that lay, you know, that lie ahead. So, if you are thinking in this transition, yes, there is potentially or arguably some role for continued use of oil, gas and coal, but there has to be some suggestion of an end date for something like coal or gas, because you have to be thinking, especially, let's say, for renewable energy. And you can see it in this way in terms of thinking about a transition or thinking about a solution. If you think, let's say hypothetically, we think the population growth in Indonesia is going to be uh, around 20 million by 2030. That's 20 million people who need access to electricity, who are going to consume more energy. You could argue, at the very least, what could be done in terms of policy is to ensure that the, the new energy that is needed for that new 20 million people is provided by renewable or low carbon energy. So you're not meeting the new demand with uh, the existing, or you know, with uh, coal or gas. So, you know, there are, it's, it's about also creating, you know, an energy mix so that you're using different types of uh, energy, you're diversifying your use of energy. But when we think about um, something like coal and we think about the argument about it being a developing nation, you know, there are some facts that we need to consider and it's not just about uh, where the money is coming from or the use of the money is co-achievable. You can look at the example I highlighted earlier of Kenya. The company said it was going to cost two billion to build that coal project. Other reports said that project would cost nine billion. And I would say before making any determination about whether uh, coal is cheap, I would look into how coal is costed. Who, who is costing the coal project here? What do they include? And more importantly, what do they exclude? And when you think about how much does even gas cost, or wind, or solar, or even potentially nuclear energy, you want to think about what is the cost of building each of those energy sources in Indonesia and what, what is done in a fair way. Because data from around the world is increasingly showing us that coal is more costly than we thought. Part of the reason is because of what was excluded in the past. Different subsidies given to coal. Globally, the subsidy rate for fossil fuels is around 10 to 1 in favour of oil, gas and coal over low carbon energy sources. So if you're an investor, knowing that you're going to get a subsidy 10 times greater if you invest in coal, gas or oil than if you invest in renewable energy, you are only going to make generally one choice. I'm going to invest in coal, gas or oil because I'm going to get more subsidies. So. And again, not all subsidies are included in the cost of building the coal project, for example. So, something maybe worth doing by um, a research group in Indonesia would be to see are those costs accurate and are, are they reflective of everything that should be included because if you look at the projections for renewable energy, you can see the projections show that wind and solar are projected to decrease in cost massively. Offshore wind is estimated to come down by 75% by 2040. 
I think solar is estimated to drop in price by 50% by 2040. They are huge cost uh, reductions. So when we think about policy steps going forward, it's not that we're saying there's a major closure of coal plants or gas production or oil production. But it's time to think maybe in a bit more of a radical way because some of the things I've highlighted, they're already happening. And I mean, it's, it's uh, clearly the case here if the capital city is going to be moved because the current one is sinking, that shows you that some radical action is needed to prevent uh, that happening to other places in Indonesia. And as I said, that could have a greater effect on tourism and other um, areas of economic growth if some of these projects continue. However, I would agree that there needs to be more international action by the developed nations and, and that was one of the objectives of the Paris Agreement in 2015. It was meant to also encourage a lot of international investment into low carbon energy projects in developing countries. And that is a responsibility, and I would agree with you, on of the developed world. Unfortunately, that money hasn't, let's say, yet all come through. There has been some positive uh, developments on that, but we haven't seen the projected figures be realized yet. But maybe, as some of these uh, issues that I've highlighted around taxation, the case law in Australia, investment decisions made by the World Bank, such as they will not invest in future oil and gas projects, we, and you know, the investment funds not willing to invest, slowly moving away from oil, gas, or coal, we may see a lot more money go into low carbon energy investments than we have in the past. But we are far away from the objective set out in 2015, and I do think that is work developed countries need to uh, work on, which you could argue that they're hindered by the, uh, some of the politicians in charge of some of the developed countries, you know, such as in, in the US, uh, unfortunately. But, um, you know, I, I think there are solutions and one of them is making, you know, low carbon energy should be able to compete in markets to the same extent as fossil fuel energy sources. And if it was able to compete in a fair way, I think we may see some change in a faster way. And particularly, let's say for a nation like Indonesia with um, you know, lots of islands, and you, know, you can already see that, I, mentioned, you know, in a similar way, there is a lot of potential for some of the Caribbean islands, uh, my own nation, Ireland is an island, you know, that there is benefits of being an island nation in terms of using uh, renewable energy sources. And I think that's something that Indonesia could capitalize on. But at the moment, I think there isn't enough being done to ensure we have full information on the cost, and also there isn't enough being done in terms of uh, the access of the sources to existing infrastructure in terms of electricity grids, but also in terms of the legislative process. So in terms of uh, the final question, uh, thinking about CCS, uh, or carbon capture storage technology, which could be used for uh, gas or coal plants. Um, that's potentially a solution, but there is a, a challenge in that at the moment it's not commercially viable. And there are estimates it may not be commercially viable till 2030 or even potentially up to 2050. So if carbon capture storage is to be a solution at the moment, it's going to require some subsidy support. 
And when we talk about subsidy support, the real question comes down to who should we give subsidy support to? And that's a question maybe each nation can answer for itself, but you can also think globally, should we, how much support should we give to, let's say, gas or coal in the form of supporting carbon capture storage? Um, so I don't know if, how many of you in the room would like to continue to support old technology. So there may be some of you in the room who 10 years ago had a, a very small Nokia phone. Does anyone remember those? You know, how many of you would be willing to switch back to your Nokia phone? Use some old technology but just because the battery life is better. If you remember those phones, you, you didn't need to charge them for a week. You know, there was no problem of uh, half the lecture room looking where the plugs are the minute they come into a lecture theatre. So, in the same way, have we not given coal and gas subsidy support for so many years? Coal has been extracted for nearly commercially for nearly 200 years. And yet we want to give it more support in terms of carbon capture storage technology. Why should we not support renewable energy? Look at the change that can be achieved in a short, a short space of time. Look at your mobile phones. You know, we should have more confidence in our engineers. We should support the fact that we encourage our engineers to deliver better technology that they could do for energy what the engineers did for mobile phones. And we now are all happy with our smartphones and we know we probably have our Nokia phones hidden away somewhere at home uh, or some of us probably threw them into the into a river. Um, but you think that is a decision. When you think about carbon capture storage, that's essentially saying, in some, to some degree, we can continue to use fossil fuels because there is this solution. So you're almost allowing fossil fuels to continue to be extracted and used because you're saying we have this, we will have this solution eventually. So it's a question of which technology do you support. I, I do think there is a reason for continuing to invest in, renew, in carbon capture storage technology, but I think the greater investment needs to be given to renewable energy. We should be supporting the new technology because the same way we do not support old technology in other areas of the economy. We don't give you drugs that worked 20 years ago when we have a better drug available. So that's a question on which technologies do we support. Uh, this law system can support the, the development of new technology, the development of uh, renewable energy, and also to test whether, for example, the coal power plant is really cheap we need to do kind of interdisciplinary research between law and economics so we could really test whether it is still viable for investment options and the world is changing uh, we don't want to kind of let behind on this trend so we will have a 15 minutes break and then we will going back to the sessions uh, to the second sessions of the lecture on the effects on the mining sector okay thank you very much